Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well out there. Now I am interviewing Investing with Tom. He is becoming quite a big value investor on YouTube. Right now he's got 41,000 subscribers and in this conversation that I'm about to have with Investing with Tom, we are gonna go through a range of topics but the key things that I wanna go over is where does he see value in the market? He's a value investor so where does he see value, what stocks is he looking at? We do talk a little bit about Micron stock, about Alibaba stock, about, we talk a little bit about Warren Buffett, about Monish Pabrai, and we talk about oil stocks. Is there value in these particular areas of the market? Let's see what Tom has to say. Okay, well, guys, today I have with me investing with Tom, or Tom for short. He is a New Zealand YouTube slash investor slash value investor i'd say he's new zealand's number one investing youtuber and also uh he comes from the new zealand's second best island which is obviously the north island we won't say what the the number one island is it's obviously stewart island not the chathams or something <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And you know what you know what actually is a good island the one uh what is it east of auckland what are they what are they called oh great barrier or something no, or waiheke the, yeah waiheke yeah apparently that looks really good i haven't been before but that looks like it'd be a nice maybe when i'm over 60 i'll retire there <laughs> yeah very nice well i i appreciate the invite back on the podcast by the way i think you must comfortably be new zealand's largest finance youtuber right or are we forgetting someone yeah, probably. Yeah, probably largest. I don't know. I don't think we. Mm -hmm. I don't know any. There might be some like, crypto person that's yeah, that's true. Up there, actually. But um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For now, but your channel is doing really good, man. I um, I just checked it out, and forty-one thousand subscribers, a good base of subscribers. So it's it's really good to see your growth, and you're teaching like good content as well. Yeah, thanks for that. It's um, it's been a few years I've been doing this now. I think it was really? 2018 I started the channel. So it's oh. kind of, it, it feels slow, but I guess when you look back at it, it's it's cool to see like the steady growth. And I've tried to yeah avoid yeah, going down steady. the, yeah, I've tried to avoid going down the, you know, super clickbaity chasing yeah. views kind of rabbit hole, which I've seen a few people do. And and that's it sort of works in the short term. Like people grow really fast, yeah. you know, specializing in some some weird topic that's hot at the time, but you know, yeah. people fall off a cliff and stall out and that sort of thing. So it's been good to just keep consistent at it, I think. So what do you think about like Graham Stephan and I, the approach that he seems to take from what I see is that he goes for, he does do like, I wouldn't call it clickbait, but like he goes for very, very sort of catchy titles, always about a crash or something. But then his approach, and I think I've heard him talk about this before, he he does that on purpose and then he tries to give as much value in the video as he can. Yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of the big finance YouTubers. Um Graham, I think, is a bit of an exception, but a lot of them are very hyperbolic and um really focused on short-term stuff. I think yeah. Graham's got a pretty sound investment approach, but there's only like so many videos you could probably make about real estate and index funds. So <laughs> yeah. he's become he's become a bit more news oriented. Um that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no one's perfect, but I, I like Graham's content. I, I don't watch all his videos, but I watch a yeah. decent chunk of them. And he has some yeah. great podcast guests as well on the Ice Coffee Hour. I, I quite yeah. like those. I definitely prefer, I think, probably podcasts in general more when the, the guests come on and they talk about money. Um, and yeah, I've watched a couple of his videos and he seems to be a sort of good ethical guy. Well, actually, a good question to ask is, well, I'll, I'll quickly just say maybe the key things we will try go over in this interview, just so the viewers can decide if they want to keep watching or whatnot. But um, I guess I'd like to do a bit of a catch up on Alibaba, just a quick one, just see, oh, okay, what are your thoughts there quickly? Um, I'll, I'll ask some questions like, do you see any value plays in the market, anything like that? And just touch base on a couple of sort of big investing topics. Um, what were we talking about? I was going to say something maybe semi, semi interesting. Graham Stephan, Alibaba, yeah. all of that. I don't know. <laughs> Does that ring any bells? Oh yeah. I was going to ask you, what do you think about, uh, Graham Stephan and meet Kevin and all them promoting FTX. Yeah. Um, that's a hard one for me. I, I, mm. I don't know. Um, 
Like I, I have partnered with Hatch, for example, for a long time, who are a, a share broker here in New Zealand. Um, but there's a lot of disclosures with something like Hatch. Like they use Drive Wealth as a third party. They disclose their um, like balance sheet annually, so you can kind of see their liquidity position and stuff. Um, yeah, and have a bit of confidence in in that case. But crypto is still pretty wild west. So I, yeah. I mean, I don't invest in crypto anyway, so I would never partner with an FTX, for example, but, um, and I'm sure you get this as well. Like I get, it's daily, maybe yeah. not so much anymore, but daily emails of, um, random crypto brokers that want yeah. a partner. And, um, I don't know how, how legit some of them are, but there's a few zeros on some of the numbers that come through sometimes. Really? Um, but you've just like, I don't know. It's, um, I, I don't have a strong opinion on it really with, um, yeah what's happened um graham put out a, a video kind of going through all the backstory and he had you know more lawyers and things involved than people might probably expect going into that sponsorship agreement and it obviously didn't work out and everyone's kind of got egg on their face but um mm. yeah not not too sure what, what's your take on the whole thing oh, i don't know i got kind of mixed views on it uh, i know a lot of people kind of look at it and they're like oh this this guy was so unethical for promoting it and but how many people actually saw that uh, FTX um, were going to go bust or were going to very, very much struggle? It, unless you were really, really following the topic, it could have been harder to see. I do know that there were red flags in it, though. But also, as a creator, it is really hard to fully vet a a sponsor because you're creating content, like you're spending all day, like, creating the actual content itself. And then what do you have to spend like another couple of days each time you have a sponsor to fully research them? It is hard. So particularly if it's a private company, um, you know, if you were to, if you were to partner with like an interactive brokers or something, you know, that's a publicly traded company with a gazillion disclosures. Um, and it's, it's more straightforward to do research, but yeah. Um, yeah. The more kind of information that comes out about FTX about, um, you know, basically doing like highly speculative, very leveraged like trades in a hedge fund with customer funds. Like, yeah, dodgy. yeah, that's crazy, man. Yeah, that's bad. I guess my main point with it would probably be I would really like to see the viewers and the people watching it take some accountability. Like, you really have to just make up your mind yourself and do your own research. That's the thing that like everyone says. So, do your own research. Know that the, a big reason why they are putting the the FTX or whatever on their channel is because they're getting paid so much money. So just just know that and do yeah, do your own research. Yeah. 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 I mean there's there's responsibility on both sides. Like creators shouldn't be partnering with companies that well that yeah. aren't aligned to their personal values, first yeah. of all. Um like you'll never see a crypto brokerage on on my um youtube channel i don't think probably regardless of how much they try and pay me so that's sort of the first thing like you've got to do your due diligence as a creator where at all possible but there is this personal like responsibility as well yeah um, so you would never partner with even like a big one like binance for example cristiano ronaldo on his instagram has has got binance on it like these big guys you well, wouldn't think about it I've, I don't even, I'm sure I could figure it out, but I don't even know how to buy cryptocurrency. I've never d touched it. Right. So, um, it's just, compl it's just not up my alley. So I, it's, it's not something I'd do. Fair enough. I'm, I'm sure it's not up, you know, Ronaldo's alley as well. He just focuses on football. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You uh, think he could explain the blockchain to us? <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe he could, maybe he knows it really well. I am not sure about that. Maybe yeah. either that or maybe he's got most of his head, mo most of his focus on the World Cup, which unfortunately didn't go well for him. Four more years. Four more years. I reckon New Zealand might win the next World Cup. You reckon? <laughs> Imagine <laughs> that. Depends what kind of World Cup. I don't know about the football World yeah, Cup. Yeah, that's true, actually. But the yeah. funny thing is if New Zealand win it, did win it, I don't even know how. We would obviously be ecstatic, but... I'm sure a lot more countries will be a whole lot more ecstatic than the Kiwis would be. Yeah, that, that'd that be next level. Yeah, we're not the biggest football nation. The other thing it was kind of interesting how you in, uh, interviewed Monish Pabrai's daughter. I think her name is Monsoon. So yep. 
how was that interview and and what like what is she like is she like a just a sort of true kind of value investor because you don't really see like can you think of any like well-known female value investors um oh it's bad that i can't i'm sure they're out there but they're few and far between like um like big ones know. though you know yeah yeah that it is few and far between i think the finance space generally is fairly male dominated for whatever reason um yeah when i look at my youtube analytics it's like 98 percent male or something i don't know if you're <laughs> you're similar but it's i yeah, have to look at mine i don't know it's it's kind of next level male dominated but um no the the interview with monsoon was really good i yeah. had been trying to tee that one up for a little while because she's just just started her fund i think she's raised like two million dollars or something in assets under management um to kind of get started um she's still fairly heavy in cash and is kind of steadily you know allocating that ca cash out to investments and stuff um so yeah i've been lining that up for a while it was nice to have the conversation and i beforehand i put up a um put up a tweet uh, on twitter obviously and and there was like lots of lots of interest bunch of questions which was which was cool. Um, yeah, going into that and chatting to her, she's, I knew she'd grown up obviously around a bonus pro, right? But um, around yeah. lots of value investors, like she went to the Buffett lunch that Guy Spear and Monish but on back in 2007 and paid 650 grand US or something. Um, you know, she's gotten to know the likes of Guy Spear because he's a close friend of Monish Um you know, she's interacted with like Lilu, Charlie Munger, Francis Chow, Prem Watsa, like the list kind of just goes on and on of really well-known value investors. Um, and she's, I think um, she's a similar age to us. I'm not exactly sure how old you are, Tristan, but um, 27. I think she, yeah, there you go. So I, I've just turned 28. I think she's 27 or 28 as well. Um, and yeah, she's got like a head screwed on straight. I think she's applied value like she seems to be applying value investing principles um you know really well and has like a very good understanding of them she's um been in a couple of different analyst roles and um has interviewed like well over a hundred different management teams of public companies in india i think um and that's taught her to get like a really good bs meter for fraud because there's a lot of that in that market by the sounds of it so um yeah really really interesting person to to interview and the feedback on that one's been great so far interesting so so what she's starting her own like actively managed fund is it is it usa yep, or indian uh yeah she started her own hedge fund i guess it's domiciled in the states but um it's got a global mandate so she can invest anywhere um she mentions she's still getting access to turkey at the moment um she has done a trip to turkey but uh, then presumably is a process to get access to it um and same with india i think that that's quite a process to get access to as well but um i think she mentioned on the podcast she'd probably have north of 20 percent in the fund in india if now if if she could access it so um yeah that that's kind of where she's at Oh, so that she needs to get some access to be able to just invest in India. Is that just because she does run the fu a fund? Uh, yeah, I'm, I actually am not sure what it's like for um, individual investors. I've never actually tried to access uh, India. I know I can't get Turkey. I'm fairly confident about that. But certainly for institutional investors, at least, there's a bit of a process to go through. Um, I know Guy Spear has talked about it taking well over a year to get access to India, possibly even more just really? to work with the regulators and stuff over there, I, I suppose. So. Yeah. Well, the Indian market will probably, there's probably seems to be opportunity there and it'll be probably be quite good for her because she has that Indian back background. Someone like me, I mean, I do see that there is potentially opportunity because they are growing so fast and the prices are lower. Uh, generally they're a lower analyzed market, but, I just don't think I understand the Indian market enough to make some some good decisions there. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure there's companies that are straightforward enough that we could get our heads around. But um, yeah, it sounds like there's a decent amount of fraud. <laughs> and yeah, there's that's a lot the problem. Of yeah, and there's a lot of companies where um, you know there'll be one family that will own like eighty percent of the shares outstanding and stuff. And um, yeah, you sort of just along for the ride and <laughs> some of those companies uh, you know the minority shareholders don't have a lot of 
a lot of voice in and where those businesses could go potentially. So, like over the past couple of months, what stocks have you been looking at? Where do you see value in this market as the market has gone down? Uh, yeah, I, I can't say I've been particularly like active with buying and selling or whatever um, this year. I've only bought one new company all year, which was a, a little regional bank called Hingham Institution for Savings. Not a stock tip or financial advice, but that's what yep. I've done. Um, and it's a USA I, bank? It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a US bank. Yeah. Okay. Um, and outside of that, I've just added to existing positions. Um, I... I don't share my full portfolio on the channel or anything, but there's definitely companies that I've covered on my YouTube channel before, the likes of Alibaba, Thor Industries, Seritage Growth oh, yeah. Properties, that type of stuff. So um yeah, there's there's definitely a whole lot more that's interesting that's interesting to me though than there was like a year or two ago. I was yeah. kind of um struggling to find stuff, but um yeah, I kind of stumble stumble across something interesting quite often at the moment it seems like actually getting across the line and making an investment takes a bit more work but um yeah um, yeah there's there's a decent amount of stuff out there so you don't share your portfolio to the public not all of it i i'm more than happy to share particular stocks but yeah um yeah i i i don't know i i i may do it at some point i just don't want to I don't want to put a whole bunch of stocks out there and say, this is what I'm doing. You should copy me or anything like that. You know, yeah. I, I, I just want to, um, I don't think I'm close to stepping over any sort of lines, but I want to make like quite sure that I don't get remotely close to it. If that makes any sense, it was probably a bit cryptic, but um, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to be cautious. Oh, okay. Well, just yeah. in case you, someone takes it the wrong way and, things go bad or something like that yeah for sure i mean the main thing i'm trying to do with the youtube channel is get across like core investment principles that will stand the test of time i'm not trying yeah. to say um you, you like um i think i actually have one of these um like um I never did the whole uh, like three stocks I'm buying type videos. <laughs> uh, you won't ever you won't ever see me do those but i think i had like in the very early days we're talking probably like late 2018 maybe early 2019 i might have done like a three stocks on my watch list type of thing something like that but um that that's not the type of stuff i'm i'm trying to communicate uh, i'm yeah, trying yeah. to like help people understand how to um how to analyze business results and mm -hmm. how to think about economics and, and that type of stuff so what would you say your predominant investing style is so like when you look at a stock what are you just are you doing the old, old school Buffett approach of like very low PE, very low PB, or are you doing like the newer Monish Pabrice uh, approach where he looks for multi-baggers or, or what would you like, how would you sum up your key approach? Yeah, I think um, I, I try to keep open to like a broad range of those types of things. So I have some companies in my portfolio that uh, like a, compounder you know type business um that i would plan to hold for a long time and i think can grow and was at a reasonable price um and i don't really well actually i have one kind of like special situation type stock in there at the moment which is seritage where um it's basically a real estate investment trust and they're going to liquidate the thing sell all the real estate pay off the debt right. and and distribute the cash so um it wasn't that wasn't the situation when i first bought into it but even if I was on the sidelines, that's the type of stuff I'd, I'd probably still look at if I thought it made sense. Um, and I'll still buy like the lower quality, really cheap companies. I'm looking at like a, um, I'm looking at like an Australian coal company at the moment that is potentially a PE of one type thing. So I'm, wow. I'm open to that, that, um, that type of thing too. P of one. So I guess they expect the earnings to, to drop off in the future. Yep, uh, coal prices are through the absolute roof at the moment. I think probably up up four x in the last year. So, um, yeah, that's unsustainably high coal prices. But it's allowed the company to pay off all their debt and like maybe earn their market cap in the next year, sort of thing. So, um, even if coal prices yeah. fall off a cliff and the cash flow slows right down, it's still might be interesting. So, yeah, I'm open to all sorts of stuff. Um, as long as I think it's undervalued, you know? So, yes.
Oh, let, let's touch on Alibaba. So last time we talked, you you were buying. Uh, I think we talked a while ago. I can't remember how long, maybe four months or five months or probably even longer. I've lost track of time. So um, what's your thoughts still on Alibaba? Uh, yeah, just to clarify, I think I've added a little bit to Alibaba at the very start of the year, but I've kind of ridden a, a fair way down and <laughs> and haven't been averaging down. I think I've mentioned on a couple of other podcasts, I think that can certainly work well if the price drops down, you average down it, you know, returns and that sort of thing. But I think it's also can be dangerous and you can get like overexposed to one particular stock. So I'll just put that out there. But yeah, um, yeah I mean, in terms of Alibaba, like there's a lot of very political things with China in general. And I try to, uh, like there's risks that come along with that, regardless of whatever your political view is. Um, but I'm at the point now where I'm just kind of focusing on the business results. So yeah. um, Alibaba reported uh, the quarterly earnings uh, must have been about three weeks or so ago now. And um, yeah, overall, I think the outcome was good. They reported um, negative earnings with generally accepted accounting principles, but the, they've got a similar thing to Berkshire Hathaway where they're, Berkshire's stock portfolio change for a quarter flows through their income statement. And if the stock market goes down, their earnings can be negative. And if the stock market goes up, Berkshire's earnings look really good. You have a similar thing happening with um, Alibaba's investments. So if you just look at their net income, it doesn't look very good at all. But if you look at their operating income, it looked really good. Um, So their revenue was basically flat, maybe grew a little bit, I think, year over year, a couple of percent, something like that off the top of my head. But the operating income grew quite substantially. They've cut a lot of costs and their loss making businesses and improved, um, yeah, kind of improved their a whole bunch of parts of the business that flow to um, operating margins. So, um, yeah, the kind of limited growth, but um, pretty good cash flows. And they also uh, seem to be allocating a very high percentage of their free cash flow to share repurchases as well. So um, that's something I, I like to see. Yeah, that's actually a very good piece of information to know that how the earnings can fluctuate so much through the investments. And so that is is a really good sign that operating income, what did you say, had gone up slightly? Uh, operating income was up pretty significantly. I, really? I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it was... Yeah, it was it was a lot year over year, like well over twenty percent. I think we should probably fact check that, but uh, yeah, it was it was up a lot. Uh, I think twenty percent might even be conservative now. I think yeah. about it, but um, yeah, it was up. It was up a lot, and um, there, but on, on flat revenue. Yeah, yeah okay. okay. What what do you have projections on what you think the revenue will will go in the future? Did you say it was just going to kind of um steadily? Well, when yeah, when I first got. When I first got invested in Alibaba, I was looking at the um, very long term, uh, like annual active customer growth targets that they had. And I was also combining that with what historically uh, annual active customer of Taobao and Tmall and so on had um, had done in terms of their spend. So typically when someone starts using um, Taobao or Tmall and starts spending money as a consumer through one of the Alibaba platforms, um, generally they'll there's a very high retention, like in the high 90% range uh, as in they'll keep coming back every single year. And um, generally they spend a lot more in year two than they did in year one. And they'll spend more again in year three and more again in Mm. year four. So I I was taking um, that spending habit data and combining that with the long-term annual active customer figures to come up with like a compounded annual growth rate for revenue. And I think I landed uh, in the low teens, maybe like 13, 14% compounded over a period of time as that um, on average to growing at 13 14 percent each year is that what you landed at correct yeah oh, okay yeah so that was that was through into the 2030s i, I forget exactly when um mm. whether i think it's two billion annual active customers was the long-term uh, target for for alibaba um and they've ticked over one billion quite recently as well so um it was cool to see them reach that milestone um so what, yeah one that's co- one billion annual one billion annual active customers yeah wow chinese is a lot of people china's market <laughs> is just massive that's like yeah how big is china like one billion and something it was like most uh of- yeah i think th- i think we asked ourselves this question on the um on the last podcast let me look it up 
Um, oh, did on our last podcast? I think I think so. You've got <laughs> we a good like, memory. Well, a lot of people. Um, one point four billion apparently is the population of China. One point four. Um, wow, that is a that is yeah. a business. Yeah, where was I going with that? So that that was like long term revenue projections. Obviously, they've had like these real harsh zero COVID policies and all that type of stuff, which has been a pretty material headwind, I expect. So, um, I I'm kind of in the camp of like it's really hard to take the current business results and meaningfully like use that to project forward. So, um, hopefully, in a year or two, fingers crossed, things will kind of go back to normal for yeah. Chinese people, and um, then we can see, you know, what how Alibaba is really performing, I think. Hmm. And have you looked much at the way they invest their money? You said that the investing investments had struggled over the past year or whatever. Do you know, do you know what their style is? Yeah, there was a period of time where um, Alibaba were just like for several years um, where Alibaba were going through this phase of almost pumping out a new subsidiary daily. And I, I mm. think that's barely exaggerating, to be honest. It was kind of unbelievable. Um, <clears throat> the, the big, yeah, the, the big one to know about is the like one third stake in ad financial. That's where a lot of the value sits, but there's um, yeah, the, oh, there's okay. a huge number of different like subsidiaries at Alibaba. There's been quite a, quite a shift i think recently so they're now allocating something like 75 percent of free cash flow to share repurchases and of their like um acquisition you know like capital expenditure has fallen off a cliff um so mm -hmm. they kind of seem to be doing less of that like potentially diversification uh, approach of of buying a bunch of other businesses and they seem to be just buying back stock um which which is nice to see like there's when you buy a share of stock that there's no there's no execution risk whereas whereas when you um go out and buy a private business um and have someone run it and all that there is execution risk and things can go great and things can go badly it just adds more certainty i think the share purchases which which i kind of like true yeah i was actually talking with my brother about the way big companies choose to invest and we talked about how amazon used to have this kind of like spaghetti approach. Maybe it was similar to Alibaba where they would like chuck spaghetti at a wall and hope that one sticks. See what sticks. Yeah, See what exactly. sticks. And then if it yeah. sticks, it can grow really, really big. And then we were yeah. talking about Meta's approach, which is really interesting. We can say that where they just chuck $10 billion at this idea. Personally, mm -hmm. if I'm honest <laughs> with you, I don't like that approach as much. But yeah, such different investing styles, Amazon and Meta. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's a lot more than 10 billion as well. Oh, <laughs> I don't really? know off the yeah. top of my head, but it's it's an enormous sum of money. Yeah. And they're yeah. they're betting the farm on it. So yeah, I mean they changed their name. <laughs> so it yeah. shows you the direction they want to go. So also I was hoping to talk a bit about Micron. Um, what are your thoughts on Micron? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I don't have an investment in Micron. It's probably yeah. outside of my circle of competence, but I, I kind of like listening to Monish Pabrai talk talk about the investment case. Um, it's seen, so um, yeah, Micron operate in the memory business. So when AWS, for example, you know, pops up a new data center, I think something like a third of the cost to build that goes to one of the three major memory players. So uh, and yeah, yeah, been, 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 been one of them. Um, so yeah, there's been a lot of consolidation in that industry. It seems that the investment thesis at least is that, um, now that there's a whole lot, um, fewer companies operating in that space, there should be less cyclicality and less brutal, like, mm -hmm. um, you know, race to the bottom pricing and that type of stuff. And in theory also less, um, like a slower rate of technological improvement. It used to be, um, again, I'm just speaking to what I've heard from Pabri here, but it seems like it used to be to the point where um, Micron would get to the stage where it can produce a certain type of chip. And then um, as they kind of build some inventory and prepare to sell that product, um, a competitor would produce a far superior chip and all of a sudden mm. Micron's inventory was kind of worthless. Mm. And um, there's a um, there's something called Moore's Law, which describes the um, speed at which um, 
like memory can uh, double. That's not me. I'm not explaining that very well. I think you can tell this is something I don't understand particularly well, but supposedly we're getting to like physical limits of Moore's law to where um, wow. the um, whatever goes into these chips is getting so small that we can't like physically get any better. So um, all of that stuff should presumably help Micron do a little better, but um yeah, we'll see. There's examples of industries that have consolidated that haven't been that well, like the auto business, for example, just because of it's a very capital intensive kind of terrible business. But um, I, I hope I hope Micron works out. Yeah, well, Pabri, I mean, I looked at his portfolio on Datarama, but this is US portfolio. So it was 80% of, or what? No, it wasn't. It might have, I can't even remember, but it was a, it was a high, high amount of his US portfolio. Yeah. Um, but I think he said that overall, he said around a year ago, it was around 20% of his portfolio. Yeah, I'm kind of uh, sort of still still looking at Micron and haven't made a made a decision. And I always think like, if you're not like certain on it, then obviously just don't swing the bat, so to speak. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't fully, fully, fully get that. It's, a, it's quite a tough industry to, to understand the, the full mechanics of how it works yeah for sure I, like i've got a um i've been using like an investment checklist i set up um for the past year maybe and um, one of the things i have on that checklist that quite often stops me actually from buying something new is just like would you rather own more of something that's already in your portfolio because um, mm -hmm. presumably you understand that better and you'll have a a much better idea of whether it's actually a um you know whether it's actually more undervalued and potentially lot less downside more upside and all that than other stuff you're interested in and in buying so um, yeah. that type of stuff quickly stops me from looking at something like micron where i'm just not particularly certain at all about what it might look like in five or ten years yeah often there's just there's just no need you know you don't have to you can just wait until you find something that's that's uh, a great investment what is the, the name of your podcast P punch card or something yeah well you got two yeah i've got a uh, punch card is the like joint live stream channel there's um there's five of us on there and we do weekly live streams every oh, saturday yeah. afternoon my time or friday night um us time i think um but i've got the investing with tom podcast as well yeah so punch so yeah i was going with that was the punch card approach where um or the Buffett quote where you would do very well just if over the entire course of your life you only bought 20 stocks you had a punch card where you could only buy 20 stocks that would make yeah. you think very hard about your next investment and not not act overly quick and really think about it so yeah uh, yeah I'm, I'm interested in micron stock but it's a it's uh definitely haven't made a, a move in it yet although I do think it's interesting how old uh, Pabri said he potentially sees a value of it of around like two hundred dollars or something. That that really stuck out to me. Yeah, for sure. It was interesting to see him do that kind of destination analysis type approach of you know where he thinks revenue could be in five or ten years. What kind of what kind of margin he mm -hmm. thinks they could could drop out the bottom and you know you put some sort of multiple on that that i guess is is what he's doing yeah do you know what multiple he put on it uh, i don't know i'd have to watch the video back yeah okay so that's interesting let's go on to to oil so i was actually i was looking at uh buffett's portfolio the other day and so far as of as of right now i believe only three quarters of 2022 have been released and in all of those quarters he bought occidental stock mm -hmm. do you see value in oil or oil companies <clears throat> yeah i um it, it'll probably be out before this for this podcast goes out but i actually filmed a video on oil just today so <laughs> that's oh, something perfect. that's kind of fresh in my head um i haven't bought anything in oil yet but it's certainly something that's interesting to me and i think i would do if i found um yeah, if the price was right and I felt like I understood the company and all that sort of thing. I think um, there's a few things at play with the oil, like you've got um, 
well, your first of all, your results in the investment are going to be very dependent on whatever the price of oil does over time. So, if the price yeah. is oil, if the price of oil is high, these like businesses just absolutely print money, which is kind of what they've done, particularly in the first half of twenty twenty two. And if the price of oil is sixty bucks a barrel, maybe or lower, basically most US large US oil companies aren't going to make money essentially really? that's kind of like that seems to be like a little bit of probably a long-term floor so um you know when oil went negative or like for a little while there was like 18 or 20 bucks a barrel or something in 2020 mm. that's just completely un- unsustainable long term um like you see those companies start to burn money so i yeah. think you have i I don't necessarily think you have to have an incredibly strong view on what oil prices will do long term. Like at a certain point, companies just get cheap enough to where they make sense at reasonably low, like modest oil prices. Um, mm-hmm. But in terms of like the supply demand dynamics, um, it, I mean, eventually the world's going to have to switch off from oil. Is the first thing, <laughs> and then um, yeah. But but if you look at the actual underlying data, like oil demand globally seems to have just kind of continued to keep trucking upwards. I think in 2020, when no one was flying everywhere, global oil demand went down something like 9% for the year. Um, was it only 9 it's, Yeah, it was only about that amount, I think. Yeah. But it but it's since bounced right back in this forecast to keep growing a couple of percent a year for, for the next few years, even with all the sustainability stuff that that's happening. Yeah. Um, and then on the supply side, like it's, it's super political. Um, there's not many politicians in developed parts of the world going out and encouraging oil companies to drill for more oil. Um, so that's not great for supply and for um, the oil price for people that want to consume it. Um, so why is and, that, that the governments don't encourage it? Uh, well, I mean, for um, climate change, greenhouse gas oh, reasons. You know, it's um, mainly the mo- the modern... Uh, countries though definitely modern parts of the world yeah yeah for yeah, sure like for usa sure. and all that 100 percent. and i think the usa is the largest oil producing country in the world at the moment okay, so, okay. Um, so it is big. Yeah, it is big that does have an impact yeah for sure and then um what else was i going to say i think um oh yeah the other thing is like the last time oil was really high if you look back at 2007 or 8 um there was a lot of encouragement from investors for oil companies to just to grow and um, you know explore for more oil and increase capacity and that type of thing. I think oil prices got up to something like one hundred and fifty dollars a barrel, and um, there was just a lot of exuberance. And um, you know, w- once they kind of came out the other side of that, and oil prices got significantly lower, a lot of investors were burned, and those investments went down or sideways for like more than a decade. Um, so if you listen to something like an Occidental or a Chevron uh, investor call, even it's like remarkably consistent with those big oil companies and even a lot of the smaller oil co- oil companies that I've uh, kind of looked into, like every single one just about, um, just about without exception is talking about share buybacks, debt repayment and dividends. There's very few talking about kind of looking for new oil. You'll, you'll stumble across some that are, you know, looking to do acquisitions and things, but that's, you know, existing oil capacity that they're talking about. Um, so, yeah, like it seems like demand will keep growing. There's a few things that suggest yeah. supply might not come online as quickly as it maybe might have done in the past with high oil prices. And I don't know, that gets kind of interesting, I think. Yeah, I guess, I guess in the third world countries, you can really tell how much they rely still on oil like even and i'm in thailand right now and it's just like 100 percent dependent on on oil um, and, the, and the demand for it is going to keep growing as they become more developed as well true well as they as they continue to build and and grow for sure yeah it's yeah especially if you look at those those growing countries like some people where well, you could debate how much what's going to happen with usa and whatnot but definitely in India and China and all these growing countries that may potentially be the next superpower. They seem to have a strong, strong demand for oil. So I don't, I don't see the demand going anytime soon as much as politicians and whoever would like to like that to change. But I guess, I guess on the other side, 
the rise of electric vehicles is one thing that you might be able to counteract that argument with and i guess it's good to see yeah i'm I'm not sure i'm sure um transport is an enormous chunk of oil use globally but i'm not sure of the numbers off the top of my head um like we obviously the world needs to wean off oil at some point or some Mm. bad things can happen (laughs) but um yeah i think if I had to guess what's flying through Buffett's head, I, I think it's probably he has a view that it'll take longer than most people expect. Yeah, that's kind of what I've been thinking. So you said um, they have to have a price above $60 for oil, right? So you would expect that to be the the case in the future? Uh, well, like, I mean, in the short term, anything can happen. Um, but I think in terms of long-term oil prices, most of the research I've seen... Um, says something in the 40 to 60 dollar a barrel range is a bit of a long-term floor like returns on capital go to basically zero (laughs) depends on the company but you know some negative and some definitely approaching that at those prices so yeah i don't think you have a sustainable kind of u.s oil industry much below 60 bucks a barrel yeah because that just the oil companies wouldn't be able to sustain it. So it would, it would kind of have to be above that price. Yeah, essentially. Okay, interesting. And is there any key stocks in that sector that you pay attention to? Obviously, I guess Occidental would be one. Uh, yeah, I, have, I haven't bought any. Um, uh, yeah, Occidental and Chevron are kind of the big ones. I think if you're an investor that's not managing tens or hundreds of billions of dollars, which I imagine that includes most of the people watching i think there's probably some smaller cheaper oil companies you could find yeah. um yeah I, I haven't i haven't invested in any but the likes of um vermilion which is a canadian stock um has something approaching like a 50 percent free cash flow yield or something at these prices although i think they have a higher cost of production so again if oil prices come down that'll disappear pretty quickly yeah. um yeah what else um maybe something like a ring energy or a pedevco i've heard um one of the guys jason after dinner investor here on youtube um talk about a little bit so um there's a whole range of them there's a guy uh, i think his name's josh young on twitter and he's been on a lot of podcasts he's a good guy to kind of follow in that space if people are interested um yeah yeah were you buying oil or oil stocks in in 2020 because that's... no i've never no i've never owned an oil stock it's really only an industry i've um started looking into this year since since seeing buffett get into it um i guess things are very easy in hindsight but i think if yeah. i knew what i if i knew what i know now um yeah i think it would have been a no-brainer personally but um yeah yeah i just i wasn't familiar with the industry at that time yeah okay interesting because I think Buffett did buy in 2020, didn't he? Uh, very little if he did, actually. Yeah, was a... okay. yeah. yeah, and he actually spoke a bit about um, oil at the 2020 annual meeting and sounded like rather depressed on the whole topic. <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, yeah, he, he was sort of talking about, um, you know, companies, you know, drilling for oil just didn't make economic sense because you're getting paid like yeah. next to nothing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's clearly changed pretty significantly the other direction. Yeah. You know who played the game really well was, uh, I don't know if you know him, but Nate O'Brien, he's a YouTube guy, and he bought a ton of oil. I don't know when. It was like 2020 or 2021. And he, he bought a ton of energy in the energy sector. And I think his portfolio is actually up by a somewhat decent amount from what I remember this year. So he's done well, and yeah. now he now he said he's actually changing his his whole portfolio to something else. Yeah, I saw Nate post that the other day. Actually, um, I, I also had a guy, um, Jake Taylor. I recorded a podcast with him the other day. That episode's not out yet, but he also bought a bunch of oil companies in 2020. So he's done quite well out of those, I imagine. Yeah, well, good on them. I was I was actually buying real estate during that time but i i was looking at the oil sector but i couldn't make any investments there because i was looking at uh, a different sector with my money so yeah what else anything else you want to touch on with the oil sector 
Um, no, I think I think Buffett probably likes the supply demand kind okay. of situation, and I think he likes the capital allocation. Like he's getting a lot of cash coming back to him and buybacks and and so on. I I don't love to. You should get him on the podcast if you can and ask him. But um, <laughs> I think I th- I think I don't think it's it's much more complicated than that probably. Yeah, imagine that Buffett on a podcast. But you know, it is that'd be next level. It's just interesting to just see how YouTubers are are growing and even yourself, like you're getting uh Monish Pabrai's daughter and like your friends with Guy Spear and stuff. And oh, didn't you have Guy Spear on your podcast? Yeah, had had Guy a couple of times now. Yeah, see, so it's just interesting to see how just YouTubers are growing and in influence, I guess. I had an, I had an, I'm not sure if you saw it because I took it down pretty quickly, but I had an absolute fail of an April Fool's last year because <laughs> oh, I, really? I, because I said I, I was going to get um, Charlie Munger on the podcast and um, I thought people would tell straight away, like, yeah. there's no way that's possible. That's a complete joke, but people, there's quite a few people that took it seriously, unfortunately. So um, I was getting all these congratulations and stuff and I had to take, take it down because um, no. I felt really, really bad about it. Um, I also um, don't know if it, it probably didn't help that I posted it like pretty early on April 1st in New Zealand, which still uh, would have been March yeah. for a lot of the world. So that probably didn't help. It might've been their first exposure to to an April Fool's joke for, for the year. So yeah. <laughs> yeah that might be, be one of the reasons why they, they misconstrued what you posted. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. But um, no, it's very cool to be able to to chat to those people for sure. Yeah, uh, but I I can't believe that people people didn't didn't um uh understand that that was an April Fool's though. But oh uh, no, to be honest, Charlie Munger has been on one or two random. He doesn't like, mind a Zoom call, yeah. Yeah, he doesn't. Sure. <laughs> I, I know. I think I talked about this last time with you. How uh, yeah, I, I heard. Uh, apparently, like a lot of the time, he's just on Zoom calls with his friends, just chatting away. Mm. Yeah, loves it. Yeah, so I reckon you might get him, bro. <laughs> we'll see. Or even Pabrai. Like, Pabrai's been on Everything Money before. So, yeah. He's been on Value Investors YouTube ch- channels before. So, that'll be great. That'll be a cool one, for sure. Yeah, because I, I feel like with, with Monish, a lot of people, um, a lot of the university talks and stuff he does, he just gets like very similar questions over and over again. I think it'd yeah. be cool to to get him on a podcast because I watched like vast majority of his talks. Um, so it'd be cool to hit him with some like, I don't know yeah. exactly what, but some things maybe slightly more out of left field that we haven't heard him talk about before. Yeah, like someone who's actually like following value investing and his content yeah. more, you'll be able to get more insight into better questions to ask, especially if you sure. think it through compared to like a university group who will kind of in general ask the sort of same questions they'll just ah oh, this guy's a value investor kind of famous they kind of probably ask like, how do we get that for the hundredth time um that um yeah that, um, I, I think it'd i think it'd be i was just gonna say i think it'd be quite cool to um get like investment kind of post-mortems from him you know things that he's bought in the past that either mm-hmm. have or haven't worked well that um you know, you, I've just been kind of familiar with over the past few years because I've been following him for a while. I think yeah. that that would be really cool to do. True, there'll be a lot of good lessons in there. I just, yeah, I just like the way he, way he speaks and he just explains things like simply and logically, and he's got all these like good analogies. So, yep, yeah, he's a, he's a good investor to follow, and he's like a young. Uh, Buffett and Munger in a way it's good to have these these guys like the, them because hopefully we get Buffett and Munger for a lot longer but who knows fingers crossed fingers crossed yeah uh, and now this is a, a question that I'm interested to ask you it's like I don't think you'll be able no you won't be able to uh, answer it straight away but it'd be interesting if you looked into it but So my brother, over the past two years, he's gotten real into value investing. And he's like, he's an interesting character. So when he gets into something, he goes crazy on it. 
and he like this like three week retreat where he just read the shareholder letters of of Buffett and got crazy into value investing and basically every two year two weeks of each year he goes on like a research spree to find like the best value stock that he can find and he found the stock I don't know if you've seen it before but it's called Gravity it's a South Korean company and he sees he's looked at the balance sheet he's looked at all the numbers and he sees a lot of opportunity here have you seen the stock before never heard of it never heard of it yeah what's Which, the uh what's what's the a, thesis there well okay well basically the key one is just the numbers so do you know what the uh do you know what the ticker is g r v y on the nasdaq yeah oh yeah Online and mobile games in South Korea, Taiwan, yeah. Thailand, and Japan. Okay. So it'd be interesting at some point if you just did a quick overview at, uh, of the stock. But he saw there's a crud load of just cash on the balance sheet. Um, so the TEV is very, very low. Um, the cash flow is really, really good on it yeah as i said the balance sheet is really really good like they got 200 uh billion is it no 200 million dollars of just cat basically cash sitting on sitting on mm -hmm. on the sideline they have 290 million but then they also have uh a bit of liabilities like 80 million in, vi in liabilities but also 80 million in non-current assets so you can let's just say they yeah. cancel each other out 200 billion just in cash on the side and the market caps only 280 million i oh, know i was i was looking in that was in the korean currency so that that was wrong but either way um, yeah i'm just i've just pulled up some of the basic stats on ticker here it looks like the business has been around a little while and then like revenue and earnings just kind of exploded year after year from like 2017 so i don't know if they did some sort of acquisition or something no sure. i think from what I know, they were just uh, so they had this one game called Ragnarok. So it's a gaming company. So this Ragnarok game did very, very well. And then what they did was they just kept spinning off different elements of Ragnarok, like try this, try this, do the app here, do a different thing here. And I think through that, it seems to have made quite a bit of money over the past sort of five years. Right. Interesting. Um, yeah, it looks like they haven't issued any stock for quite a few years. So presumably all that cash on the balance sheets from the actual business as opposed to raising capital. Um, yeah. Trades at a, jeez, <laughs> enterprise value to EBIT of 1.5. Is that correct? Enterprise to EBITDA, I or, guess. A, or a P of 7. P of 7. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm not much of a gamer, but um, sounds right. interesting. Yeah. So this is like the one stock after he did like his his research, like uh, just going in depth. Like basically he goes through all the stocks in the stock market trying to find a a value play. And this is the one that, that he found. <laughs> How does he do that? Every Aren't there like 50,000 stocks in the world? Well, so I don't know if it's if it's the world. It might be the USA. Country. Isn't the USA how many stocks in the USA market? Uh, a few thousand, I think. Like, I think it's like four thousand. So maybe it might only be the USA. He does have some screen screeners as well. Um, but yeah, he just he just spends a lot of time basically. Interesting. Um. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Not not familiar with that one, but um, it seems yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Be interesting. You, you just want you just the the one red flag that immediately comes to my head is like is it just a is the game just a fad and like those earnings going to fall off a cliff? But yeah, that, that is the real big question of the the stock. Um, from his calculation, he did do a growth where even if it does fall off a cliff, it um you don't actually lose that much money. I think his his valuation was like if earnings do grow by a negative 20% each year, 
um, which he didn't think would happen. Most likely not. It would still he would still be able to sell the business for two hundred and forty million. This is all his calculation. So because because he tries to follow the he loves Monish Pabra as well. So he tries to do the heads I win, tails I don't lose much. But yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of like this funky coal thing I'm looking at the moment looking at at the moment of oh like, yeah what's this thing look like if coal prices go down 80 percent? because that's probably more like a normal coal price <laughs> um yeah, yeah yeah it's interesting but i will say if there are any value investors who've got some time or are looking for an opportunity um do go go look at that stock and just see what holes you can find because my brother really wants to know what holes he can um people see in that stock and I will be releasing a video of me interviewing him just to get his overall thesis. But cool. I just thought I'd put it forward to you just to see if it interested you, or if you saw anything. But obviously, it's yeah, whatever. If yeah, it, yeah. yeah it, it's hard to it's hard to look at these things on the fly. But um, I know, yeah, yeah I, I can see the appeal just looking at some of the basic metrics. But you'd want, yeah. I'd, I'd have to know more about the business. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on appreciate the time and so obviously viewers can find you on your your investing with tom youtube channel forty one thousand. twitter is it what investing with tom on twitter i'm at tom investing on twitter at tom investing and then the two podcasts which we talked about um yep. and yeah go listen to the one that he did with monsoon for bry i'll i'll try uh find the time to listen to it i haven't listened to it yet um so that that would interest me yeah i must uh i must um figure out a time with you to get you on there at some stage i probably said that last time but um it hasn't happened so we, we if must you want um, yeah I, I don't profess to be like a genius value investor but um yeah if you want <laughs> that's all good we, we could talk about other stuff as well business yeah for sure pick, pick your brain on youtube and business and yeah youtube good stuff. i love i love youtube and um different tactics and styles and blah 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 yeah for sure no this was fun tristan i i appreciate the invite yeah thanks for coming on man boom all good well to everyone who made it through to the end good on you because i really do think that the people who have a long attention span are the ones who are more likely to take in all the information and do better with investing in general as I'm sure a lot of you do know, most investors actually lose to the market. Most investors, if you look at the stats, don't even get half of what the market gets. So congratulations. If you made it through to the end, I know you are not like most investors. I just wanted to make this quick announcement that I am releasing my, my course, my premium course called The Investing Academy, where you can see my stock portfolio, where you can see stock portfolios of what other super investors are buying. If you are interested, Click the link in the description below. I hope you got some value out of the conversation that we just had.